Okay. Uh, so this is session number nine for the floating marine laboratory. Uh, we are very lucky today because we're in for a treat. We have uh, two amazing guest speakers. Um, so we have uh, Margaret Ikeda and Evan Jones. Maybe you can make a, a, sh a short introduction first because we, you're going to speak a lot after. Uh, how would you introduce yourself? Oh, hi. I am Margaret Ikeda. I am a professor of architecture at California College of the Arts. Both Evan and I did our master's degree at UC Berkeley uh, and then started teaching and uh, since 2014 we've been working on architectural projects on water, both speculative and prototyping. So we're really very excited to meet you all and um, share and learn from you today. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, that's basically what you said. Um, we have a firm together. Uh, we were doing housing and uh, also furniture design. We started doing installations and furniture. So we have kind of a, uh, an affinity to uh, constructing and putting things together and detailing. So the firm is called Assembly. So it's about sort of collaborating with people, but also with materials. So that sort of double, so double meaning is kind of part of what we So your value. students are master students? Yes, they're all master okay. students. Uh, right. uh, there's a bit of a mix of architecture students and landscape architecture students. Right. Landscape okay. landscape. Right. Well, perfect mm. for this. Yeah, and also a mix of years. I think some of them are in the, the old masters, but in different years, I think. So when we uh, were at UC Berkeley, we won a competition to build an exhibition space on, okay. in our department. And there's money for materials, not, no labor. And that's how we started because we, we're able to build what we are design what we designed and spent a whole summer doing that and that became our thesis project. It wasn't planned, it just happened. And then from that, uh, the economy was bad. And so we ended up doing a lot of inst uh, exhibits at um, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And then we were, we, that show went to Austria. So we, we went, not only just Evan and I, but a couple of our colleagues too. So we really started out building, building for architects. So we got to yeah. understand how architects think and how to detail and make that happen. So it was a very good, that wasn't how we thought our architecture education would unfold, but it ended up being that way. And so it was before maker or maker space was even, <laughs> yeah. now, right. it was just making. <laughs> And so the, the way I got to know you guys is because I was a resident at PN9 uh, as yeah. an impact resident in 2016 because uh, our son, uh, Abby, and, uh, she was pregnant and so she wanted to give birth in San Francisco where she's from, my wife. And so I had to come to America and so I worked at PN9 for a while. And then I saw the amazing work that you guys were, were doing back then. And um, yeah, so I've been following your work since then. I was just bumped into your work in, in there in 2016. And uh, yeah, I was super impressed and I looked it up online and, and I saw that you actually made it on the water. And so I'm super mm -hmm. excited that you, that, I mean, that we met uh, just uh, yes. last month in San Francisco and um, very, very kindly that you accept to, uh, to speak to my students who are, who are doing a very connected work. Um, so um, I, I like maybe to give like a, just a bit of context to the course and uh, let the student introduce their own work uh, in a very short form. So like this, like you mentioned, like, like this would have a better context of, um, of uh, how you want to present the work as well, or maybe kind of oriented in, an, in a specific perspective. Sure. So this presentation, I, I'm going to do a very short version of what I presented for the crit last week. So last week they had a crit and they presented all their works. But yeah, so we, did see, um, we did see the beginning of your presentation. Uh, okay, so, okay, so, so, I don't, so yeah. Okay, so, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so the idea, I think, what is uh, fundamentally different between what your studio is looking at and ours is that we are more focused on developing a specific floating uh, laboratory. Mm -hmm. But I think in a lot, of the, a lot of the designs that your studio would be looking at is how to make a floating city. I'm not saying this is a, a bad thing to do. Uh, what I'm saying, what we're trying to do is that we are working actually with a, with a group of scientists in our university to actually build an instrument for them, if you will to mm -hmm. support different communities. So some people who are farming, some people are, who are doing tourism to, to understand how we could use that as a lab to develop all their, their idea, like a pilot, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we are at the end of, uh, we just finished phase one last week. So they have all their individual concepts. 
And uh, what I would like them to do, each of them, is to present their concept individually like this in just three sentences. Uh, introduce their name, uh, the design, the community that they're serving, and then third, say what is special about their concept. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So uh, everybody's okay with that. So I can see uh, the face of Max, Zengyu, Kelvin. So uh, I will call your name uh, and then uh, oh, we can go through the list perhaps. Uh, we can go on the, on the list, um, maybe like this, we don't have to switch between screens. <laughs> nice. Okay. So uh, uh, Chang Kits, uh, are you ready? So can you introduce, say, say your name, the way we should pronounce it, your group? And then in a, in a sentence, what is special about your design? Yes, of course. My name is uh, Chen Kit, and my design is basically a floating farm. It is uh, designed for the, for the farmers, the fish farmers. I would like to uh, design a floating farm, uh, which is basically located in the uh, shallow water. Uh, I combined a multi level uh, farm system uh, to the to the to a sh uh, movable structure uh, so we can uh, move to a safe bay while we are facing uh, a, a typhoon. So, yes, that's basically what I designed. So the uh, the lower level, it, it, this is, is the lower level how it just is adjustable. It's it's hung by nets. Uh, yeah, I I think it can be adjustable in this mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. And the mass, what's the point of the mast? What uh, pardon? Oh, the you have a. It looks like you have some sails on it. Yes, uh, uh, it's basically uh, fish cages, and I would like to input a sail and rudders, uh, rudders so it can be moved oh, I see. by wind power. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Then to the next person. Okay, so then we have um, Kanosa. Uh, hi. My name is Kenosa. So uh, my de design is uh, built for the co uh, coastal community. And the main uh, aim is to create a linkage between the changing ocean condition to the uh, facility provided to the community. For example, I link uh, the plastic pollution problem of the ocean to the levels of this device because I use the uh, trash bin as the voting boy for the whole device so that uh, people know uh, when they litter on the ocean, there will be a change in their life as well. Thank you. Then we have uh, Max Kaufman. <clears throat> yeah, so my, my plan was to use uh, to develop kind of an app and something that is very much uh, inspired by your uh, 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 ecologies lab um, to better survey how uh, tourism's in, uh, tourism impacts uh, the life in, uh, in ocean, like in ocean tourist regions. And uh, I kind of used uh, 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 an device called Swarm Diver, which uh, is already developed and which can then uh, research better or better uh, monitor the health of the marine life and the coral reef life. How big do you imagine this to be? So they're like small, they're deployed. And so I would do it as a boy, which is around. So this is, those are the Swarm Divers. Um, so, but they would be only a <coughs> attachment to the then bigger boy. Which I, is about, I think the 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 no, with right now is at about two meters. Mm -hmm. So the swan diver does what exactly? Uh, because I wanted uh, to research also pollution and the life of coral reef, but I thought it's easier to have a fixed boy and then a movable part instead of a big thing that moves. Mm -hmm. um, and these are also you can uh, use them also in break zones because they uh, 
they, they, yeah, they work in nearly every uh, ocean environment. Um, so it's easier to have small parts that are movable instead of a big one, which is then very like prone to waves and, mm -hmm. and the currents. Yeah. Okay. So on your diet on the drawing, it looked like I'm not sure. Were there some of um, sensors on land? Uh, no, no, no. no. So the uh, the idea was to like place something somewhere in the bay where it's like not in the somewhere on the side. So uh, this drawing right here. This drawing was the green. initial initial idea to to use also use data on how many people are actually visiting to, oh, to kind of okay. compare what is the kind of bearable amount of tourists. But then there was like criticism last week on if there's not only the amount that counts, it's also how the people behave. And that would then be very difficult to monitor. Mm -hmm. And so they use the design of your, of your studio mm -hmm. as inspiration for like um, uh, putting a lot of the instruments uh, mm -hmm. inside of the... Of the yeah. yeah. Exactly. No, that's mm -hmm. we. I would Great. say that one, that's one of the things that people have been excited about the float lab is once something is moored like that, the potential for many different people to add their research for censoring uh, for different things. Right now, we have one that is an acoustic sensor that is with one of our collaborators because um, we have very little traffic in the bay because we're shut down, and so it's in the port and the port has containers coming, but ferries, everything else, the major transportation is done, is, is quiet. So they wanted to take a sensor for the next 10 days to figure out if it's impacting um, fish. If they can hear fish. Like they'll be able to hear yeah, the fish. So these sensors. Uh, they're really capitalize on, capitalizing on a moment that, you know, hopefully Might won't happen, happen. Yeah. again. We'll see. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, um, uh, like sound monitor, like mm -hmm. sound sensor was mm -hmm. also one of the ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Hello. Um, so I'm Maxwell, and my concept is basically a passive debris um, collector aiming to review the plastic deb and debris that are often cleaned up and not seen by the public. So it actually borrows the idea of opening an umbrella, and the umbrella cuff could be our mesh, and when it begins to fold, the plastic can be trapped and prevented from being washed back to the ocean. So I actually mm -hmm. adopt three size, three mesh size after studying the size of different debris like water bottles and styrofoams. They so could be 1 mm, 60 mm and 200 mm. So there are three 1 mm bags for the collected debris to stay. And there are two kinds of rope. One, the one in, in red is actually kind of shorter, it allows the device to be relatively fixed on the water by connecting it to the stone or something more solid on shore. And another one is blue. They are the longer ones as from the frame as uh, uh, as Can you see it on this drawing? This, are the blue and red visible on this particular drawing? Uh, maybe on the first drawing. Yeah, uh, over here. Yeah, from this frame, you can see that uh, it explains how the umbrella movement, uh, how the umbrella moves, and when the blue rope is actually pulled, there is a mechanical connection to make the ribs of the umbrella fold. So basically, mm -hmm. it's a kind of small device, like one point two meter times one meter. So the water, and we, I try to use the water bottles to give some buoyancy to the device, uh, intended to use recycled. Uh, bottles and is that yeah. It? <coughs> yeah so that yeah okay um very elegant have you seen the manta what is that called the manta ray yeah the manta ray I was thinking of that too, it's not yeah. manta ray it's a manta something oh. uh manta the animal 
No, no, no. Oh. It's not the animal. No, it is animal. a device it's for plastic. Uh, Seabin? No. No, it's not Seabin. Anyway, there is a device. That, that's it. Yeah. Yours is much more beautiful. Oh, the trawler. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that's what they've been using in our San Francisco Bay. They just did a very big study on um, oh, yeah. our microplastics in our bay. And we actually, we're not going to show you this today, but maybe we can in another time, another setting. But we have a team in another course that we're teaching that okay. it's called the Biodesign Challenge. And it's a, it's a challenge that's uh, put on by a group in New York City. And our team is working with bioplastics. With, uh, and we're working with some biology, well, some synthetic uh, biologists and uh, material um, designers from the, some of the universities here. So we could we could maybe give you more information if that if, mm -hmm. if, if you guys end up going that direction, because we've yeah. compiled a lot of information about bioplastics. Sure. Um, Cisa, I think you're on mute. Oh, thank you. Yes. There's this uh, French navigator called Yvon Bourgnon, and he's uh, fundraising uh, now to build these gigantic um, quadrimaran, these very, very large boats, to, uh, to actually capture plastic. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's very ambitious. Yeah. I don't know how, how, how much it's going to work, but it's, uh, yeah, he's a very ambitious person. Good. Nice. I haven't seen that. That's uh, I send, yeah. I send it to you. yeah, send me that link. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, cool. you, I think the best thing might be. I can write it down. In, in the English article, Daily Geeks. Maybe this one is in English. Mm -hmm. Hold on, man. In general. <laughs> oh, no, it's in French. Oh, well, it's okay. I, I, I That's right. Me. Evan, can I read it? French. <laughs> oh, you do? Okay, here you go. Okay. I do, yeah. <laughs> okay. We say Francais, yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, then the next question we have um, is going to be uh, Gavin, I think. Gavin, I think but I've been having some problems, um, GitHub, but um, my, all my stuff in Jessica's page. Okay. okay, then we have Senna. I don't know if she's updated. Last time I checked, she had not put it. Um, oh, you did? Yeah, but it's not showing on my computer. I don't know why. <laughs> and all the profile images are like broken icons, and I don't know how can I fix it. Okay, no problem. But yeah, it's good that it works on yours. <coughs> okay, so my name is Senna, and uh, the topic that I focus is uh, transportation and shipping. So I chose a cargo port uh, in Zhongshan city to uh, kind of renovate it and to improve the uh, working efficiency uh, by like re layouting uh, the ports. And also, I want to like uh, make use of the existing empty land and turn it into like a more educational space or communal uh, space for public to uh, to get in to see the working flow of the cargo ports. Mm -hmm. So she worked on an actual site where she has personal connections, um, and half of the site. So you see here, there's the original site, and there's a plot of land uh, on the left here that is unoccupied. So now they only do shipping, and she wants to add an educational component, so increasing the surface area to get the boats in, and uh, have half of the space that must be uh, dedicated to education and mm -hmm. automate, uh, do a lot of automation. Yeah. yeah. We've been working, as Cesar has probably said, we've been working with the Port of Oakland here in the San Francisco Bay for... Okay at least five years, five or six years. And we have been working with them in a port, where the float lab is, is a part of their uh, property that they oversee that is a public, um, mm. that was dedicated to the public not very long ago. So it was only about, uh, well, maybe now a long time ago, 20 yeah, years ago. Right. Actually, you can see it on. on the... mm. If you uh, look at actually, you can see in that Oakland port courts. Uh, let's see, oh, it's hard to point. <laughs> if you, if you uh, pull up Middle Harbor Shoreline Park, that's what it's called, Middle Harbor Shoreline Park. There it is. Yeah. Sure.
Yeah. You see that? Yeah. Or are you frozen? Am I? Yeah. Oh, it's very strange. It's not responding. Yeah. yeah. Oh, here we go. I'm okay. just going to type it in here. Hopefully. Anyway, uh, it's, I'm sure mm -hmm. ports in Hong Kong ports all over. It's a small world when you start to think about ports. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a very uh, big interest in engagement with the public. Uh, in um, and I think it'd be very interesting to think about since there is land there to think about even beginning to think about maker spaces uh, that are yeah. part of the educational component because when we teach our students we know we're never thinking in terms of just building it in San Francisco Bay but how these different kinds of systems could be deployed to different parts of the world so we start with containers like how does when how does your work get on a truck to a container but it always yeah. has to fit at least in the size of a container and the standardization it's kind of interesting because the standardization of containers i think started in oakland so that that's where they came up with a this consistent size and it just became like the the standard size all over the world i think it you just take that container you put it on a truck and you know there's there's an incredible uh it's it's very uh, beautiful you know they had so a, you can see uh, all the cranes are on the other side so this cove this <coughs> this um now it's a the, all the edge conditions so it's not very wide but that edge condition is a public park so you might want to even think about a con mm -hmm. you know a kind of park element so especially if you have landscape architects in your um, program there could be a proposal that you're bringing that has a, a, a component that you build in with the port and what's amazing about the port is that you could literally sh make and ship right from mm. where you are located so yeah. our first studio where um was really about having a research educational so if you go on our website, there's a when we're there's a couple of years of projects that were uh, just on just here, which were architectural designs, um, imagining research center and um, educational center. So if you go to uh, just the student work, well, that's just the screenshot. Oh, okay. Well, we can. Yeah. It's on our architectural ecologies lab, but it was so if you, you have to scroll down. down to the student curriculum. So it was up, 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 to, yeah. up, up to uh to the right where it says Boyan Ecologies Oakland, down one. Uh yeah. To, to the right. Yeah. No, that one's Maldives. So that yeah. was but the, yeah, right, right, there, there, right, there, right there, yeah. So all that work was you can go into that, deeper, that was site, it was middle but that was all about education, educational and research. So how you could build in to these sites um, with components and begin to imagine um, something that would change over time with as sea levels rise, which is, I mean, I'm sure since you have people that you know within the port, that is something that all ports are now having to look at really closely, uh, what, what's going to happen uh, with their facilities yeah. as uh, sea levels rise. So. so they're very, they're actually very proactive. We met some some Dutch people who were there too, uh, just talking to the port about uh, these issues. And be, because it's such a huge infrastructure, it has a huge amount of the economy comes in through at least the port of Oakland or LA. It's it's amazing. So st uh, go back to that one. Um, if you, th uh, one more. So this one would be just interesting for any of you that are building on land. So if it's a port, <coughs> this was a design. So we are working with an engineer for, that's called, their company's called Era, but they're a very big international um, engineering firm. And they did a critique of this project. And we, we use fiberglass because we, it is what you can build boats with. And it's a, we work with a fabricator here. And so this is, a, they have this, engineer helped us come help this team come up with a floating foundation so that the formwork would be uh, would be fiberglass and you'd pour concrete but literally over time if sea levels rose this thing could float yeah. it's built so it to has float a, it has a perfect shell you know so, in these different compartments that 
Yeah, this one won a national design. Uh, we, it won one and of the national awards. And it had floating research component on the left, so you can see. So there's like, sort of one land-based and one floating, but ultimately the, the narrative was that it could float just based on the way it was designed. So that's something to consider when you're designing on land that with the consideration of what might happen in the future. Yeah, so you can build in a very different way. Yeah, on the thank way. you very much. Yeah. Good game. <laughs> and then we have um, Sim Chung Fei Nathan. Um, yeah, so my project is based on a reclamation project in Hong Kong, which is really large scale that where uh, researchers are concerned that it will create more dead zones in the water. So that there be, there might be instances of uh, oxygen depletion or algae booms. So I'm taking this chance to collect these algae using a prototype system, where it's kind of like a floating concrete with different functions. So this kind of polygon has uh, kind of motors to collect algae and at the same time to create uh, oyster farms that which might supply or create open markets. So so it's kind of like uh, a measure to reuse the dead zones or to reuse the waterfront. Yeah. So it is a dead zone right now? Uh, it is not because it's not, the reclamation hasn't been on yet, but we I'm assuming that it's going to be passed through. Because reclamation it, of land, like they're going to be filling in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of the orange part, which is uh, a really big zone. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh wow! Is that uh, is, is this that... near Hong Kong? Yeah, yeah, it's in Hong Kong. Wow, it's in Hong Kong. So yeah. everything that's in orange is going to be new. Yeah. yeah. Yikes! <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> okay. We saw a lot of that in the Maldives. Yeah, smaller it's, scale. Yeah. So the the parts in red is what has already been reclaimed in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is already massively yeah. Uh, reclaimed. Yeah. Where is the, uh, San Francisco too. where do they get the reclamation sand or earth? Do they take it from the ocean or do they bring it from the land? I think they got it from China, yeah. A lot of it is uh, construction wastes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because they keep demolishing old buildings and they just fill the ocean with uh, rubble, basically. Yeah. So they're like trash, they're building on trash. Oh, that's a lot of San Francisco Bay is, yeah. San Francisco is that too. It's, uh, Not now. Not now, but it was. And they're also talking about building those massive bridges to connect those uh, those new islands. Okay. Yeah. And these are strategies very similar to the Maldives. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think of how you can look at, uh, and this is a little bit like the flow ladder, it's just thinking about how you can recreate some of the ecologies that you're losing, because when you reclaim, you you take essentially like a, a gradated ecotone of, of, of habitat, right, of coast, uh -huh. and then you, you just, you kind of just make it a, a single, like a reclaimed area. So there's something you could put on the outside of that that can be habitat for species that are covered up by the fill. So mm. that's just one sort of idea that comes to mind about it. Is this the same project? No, that's a sun. No. Oh, okay. No. Uh, hi, I'm Zheng Yu, and my design is also a floating farm. And my idea is to create a, a small ecosystem in each unit, which can realize the zero input and zero output so that it will not influence the environment, but also it can purify the ocean water because it contains oyster and seaweed in each you need and people can use the pulleys to harvest different species at different levels so it, it's more easier to get the things out of water and it can drag can drag away by the boat so it is also movable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the small unit can combine to larger units so people can work work on that work on that platform 
So the different layer, okay, so fish, <clears throat> so you have a fish layer, fish waste, mussel seaweed, oysters, mm -hmm. okay. So are you working with bio, marine biologists so that um, from Hong Kong so that you're able to sort of finally calibrate these kinds of strategies? Yeah, we, we, we interview some biologists and also the people who do aquaponics. Uh -huh. he, uh, he gave us suggestions about how, how these uh, species work and how they coordinate with each other. Mm -hmm. Right, because I think that is what we've learned from our biologists um, is just how finely kind of calibrated you need to be with the, you know the poop of the fish and then where that goes and you know how you're creating this whole sort of system. So it's you you've done such a nice job with the diagrams uh, to be able to show them this will be really helpful and then they could critique it about what would probably actually happen in terms of like. Especially mm -hmm. the zones, like I'm not sure how deep everything is in terms of where, or maybe you have it here. Okay. When nicely, yeah. yeah, just to even have elevations in your drawing to know how deep you're thinking of going for different, for different um, species. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, and the argument should be uh, rather than I think like making everything completely closed because then it would probably have a different look but to think about what the output is and how that could actually be beneficial as opposed to, you know, you know, intense and destructive, right? The, so. um, the pulleys are great. Love that. Mm -hmm. There's a nice precedent I thought of, I think it's, it's in China is that they have four carp that they use in a pond and the four carp actually uh, have different functions and so the whole thing is a really nice closed loop so when you you look at aqu aquaponics or aquaculture you know you can that that's the best extreme the worst is like a fish uh, shrimp farming where they just dump a lot of nutrients and then you contaminate the soil and, you know so there's I think you want to almost look at some precedents and say like we're we're more along this line than well we are that <laughs> <laughs> we are the closed loop we're trying for that anyway Right. Jessica and uh, I guess uh, Kelvin. Yeah, okay, so I'll start first. So my design, um, mainly we have three programs that correlates with the devices that I chose to put on my platform. So the first one is the water level electricity generators, which you can see like on the peripheral of my um, platform. And then so these, generate the electricity needed to function the entire platform. So the cafe and like tables and seating. The next device is a trash collection bin um, that provides a splash playground. And then the third device is a marine protected zone to foster marine life. Where is the marine protected zone? Yeah, could you just go through them one by one? Like, so yeah, it should be at the top. Okay. Yeah, if you look at the axon drawing, like maybe the third, yeah, like scroll down a little bit. Yeah, like here, okay. you can kind of see that I have this idea of like having a underwater viewing space of the marine protected zone. Mm -hmm. oh, I see. Uh -huh. Nice, yeah. We went to a, zone, uh, a place like that in the Maldives. They have a restaurant uh, that is underwater. Uh, not very deep either, uh, and they actually reconstructed, uh, they had these coral reef tables so that you sit and they actually admitted that they feed the fish so that because when we got went down there, all of a sudden these sharks started coming and because they're just triggered by our movement, they know that they're going to get, they yeah. think they're getting fed. Probably not good for Yeah, that's sharks. it. That's yeah. the place. Mm -hmm. And you know what we learned that, so we went into the restaurant, we just did it as architectural professors so we just paid a minimum fee because we didn't want to pay the money to eat there so we got to go to the restaurant but then I didn't know because I would have asked to go in it they had a um, they have an underwater room that is fifty thousand dollars a night and apparently oh, wow. yeah and we couldn't believe it we're like are you sure fifty thousand mm -hmm. it's fifty thousand a night to stay in this under so <laughs> clearly you know there's this 
<clears throat> yeah, that's it. So you do walk down just like this, uh, like you have kind mm -hmm. of drawn, and then come into, so you, you kind of want to think of that sequence and how it sort of opens up to this, yeah. uh, this space. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> And really, it's not that far down. And what's interesting is they, I think the glass was made in... Singapore. It came from Singapore it, it all was, as one thing, basically. Yeah. Or the glass was made in no, the States. No, it was glass was either in the yeah. States or in Europe. I can't remember. And yeah. then it was, it was, it was assembled in Singapore. in Singapore. And then, so you're close, you know, this is all possible that this kind of technology has been done. And yours will be better. <laughs> It will be. It would be interesting if you would have the way you incorporate the ecological systems, like the ecologies that will help benefit, like whatever is supporting this, even if it's underwater, like if this is floating or suspend, because this is not floating. It's on piles, so it's halfway. It's not on the it's ground. Fixed, yeah. It's fixed. But there is this whole underside that I'm sure they did not consider the ecologies underneath. Um, so I think it'd be interesting for you to take it even farther, like how this system, whatever structure is in the water can be um, facilitating. This is how it was. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Did you look at this as a precedent? Um, no, I didn't. But I will now. Yeah. But you know, it also reminds me of um, uh, Tadao Ando. His, uh, do you know his project? Uh, that yeah. is this um, chapel. Yeah. There's a chapel where you walk. Actually, you walk down this. Is it, I didn't get to go, but is it walk uh, around the side. Light, yeah. You sort of almost come in at the top. It's, I think and it's then, the water chapel. Yeah, you walk down into the water. So it might be one, um, it's one that I wanted to go That's to. That's it, yeah. Yeah, so you yeah. actually start, so if you think of it as starting at the level that you're talking about, and then then the dissension. And for him, so I would be, he's a really good um, person to think, because all yeah, the of this, the procession is you walk around is and you come through. as important yeah. as the actual moment you get to. So you can think about Japanese tea gardens and it's always about taking you from, you know, the chaotic city and in the moment at each step is taking you into a different kind of um, zone of, mm -hmm. of um, relationship with your body. So mm -hmm. in this case, you actually walk down into... Actually, this one looks like way. your project. Yeah. <laughs> Could be your project. Because the stair is right in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Right there, yeah. Yeah, so there's something interesting about dropping down. Yeah. Yeah, I like how you've done that. Because there, there's some, you could also maybe interact with the water in a way, in a safe way, before you go down. So there might be opportunities to do something like Actually, that. Actually, to be touching the water yeah. in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get down and, and you realize you're on a hill. So the light's coming in from the side. So that, that's so something interesting about that. You didn't go? No, I didn't get to wow. go. <laughs> we gotta go. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good good precedent I think to look at. Do you have um from um, there's still Gavin's I, project? Okay. Yeah. On my page, yeah. 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 Um, it's right below, uh, right there, under, up, up, up one side, please. Yep, there we go. Okay, um, oh, my design is yeah. actually quite similar to Jessica's design. It's okay. also a floating platform. Mm -hmm. but my concept takes reference of the Seabin um, mm -hmm. project by a group of scientists. Yeah, we, in, uh, we just Australia. got that last two weeks ago, actually. Yeah. I think we yeah. were, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. My name's Gavin, sorry. Hi, Gavin. Hey. Yeah. Hello. So we became familiar with this just. Was it last week? Last two weeks Friday? ago, yes. Two weeks, yeah. Yeah. But you Wait, scaled so, it up. Yeah. Sorry, you're lagging a bit. I can't hear you. Sorry. 
you scaled it up? Is it? I mean, what's the scale of your? Oh yeah, yeah. I I scaled up the the project. So it's basically oh, yeah. enlarged Seabin um yeah. the uh, device, but then I added a um viewing deck and underwater viewing deck, on the mm -hmm. outer ring of it, so that when people go down to the viewing deck, they're looking at the marine life like um that mm -hmm. is being protected, and then mm -hmm. the, behind them there's like the um the net that is containing all the um, rubbish that's collecting by the Seabin device. Mm -hmm. So it's like a serves more like an educational device that shows the effects of rubbish on the ocean, but it helps like with actually uh, practically collecting trash on the uh, in the ocean. I kind of chose like Seabin like as a reference because like it's already working and then it's already functional. So in that rendering right there, like is there a con like do you get this sort of contrast between clean water and dirty water? Is that is there or is that a mirror? Uh, I think like, because I'm basing this project in Hong Kong, for Hong Kong waters, it's actually quite hard. Like the visibility underwater is only, I think about three meters. Okay. So like, it's more about like looking at the rubbish like behind you. Okay. Yeah. 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 It was like, it's like that for us here too. Yeah, we're like less than a meter. So you and Jess, so can you show Jessica's project? So it's it's sort of similar, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. Because okay. we're in the same group, yeah. You're in the same group. So she yeah. got, you both have the um, collection of energy, those devices. I, I have never seen those before, but they spin on the side. Yeah. Both of you have similar, but, okay. Yeah, but I'm only focusing on um, the trash collecting part mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. educational okay. reference part. Yeah. And hers kind of like a yeah. platform for all kind of activities. Yeah. But I think you all would be um, designing a system that could have different variations. Yeah. Right? So you could see how yours could merge very easily. Hi, my name is Cici and this is uh, my project. So basically I work closely with Oswin um on this project so the project is called the ocean collab is a self-sustaining platform for researcher and potentially for the public um uh, Oswin, maybe also we can talk about it as well because yeah we combine the project together yeah so the the lab is actually targeting the uh, various uh, devices that as you can see from the previous uh, presentation there's a lot of devices related to marine but we were thinking they're all specific to one particular thing so that's why we are trying to make a kind of a mechanical system, uh, a kind of a platform, a raft that allows this plug and play module of different variant, uh, various kind of um, uh, research uh, modules into our system. So it can actually go together when necessary. For example, I think we also include, uh, try to reference one of uh, your design, trying to see if it actually can be fitted into one of our system. And this system can be detached uh, and attached uh, when, ne when necessary. Uh, so it's completely flexible and we really hope to create that kind of collaboration between different kind of parties relating to oceans. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, what was your name? I missed your first name. So my name I, is- I heard Ceci, but not- Ceci and this is Oswin. Oswin. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the name of this project, but there is a project that we had referenced um, that was like a kit of part. It was a housing, but it, it was a kit of parts of modules. I don't remember who it was. Remember? It it's, not that, it's, it's not that great. I mean, but it's interesting Wait, because, no, no, it wasn't oh. our studio. It was a project that we had told our students to look at when we were doing the Port of Oakland. Uh, yeah, it might be. It was maybe it's that one above the disaster. It was it was this one the module housing for disaster victims. It could have been something like that. That, that it was a group that was it was a business model life art. That's it. Okay, you're so good right, at right. this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so good. Yeah, so life art. Um, and I, I do think yours is different in smaller scale, but you might just look at it because they've been developing this over time uh as a module it's more of an urban strategy but i think if you think of the components like urban components uh you reduce them to different uh 
experimental components that you would do as a researcher in the ocean. You know, there's well, this is, but you're talking about coastal conditions. So th this is coastal too. This is usually this is close to. I mean, they've evolved. I haven't seen this image, but they've been working on this for many years. So they, you just might be able to look at them for mm -hmm. ideas and ways that they've integrated uh, systems. And of course, the Dutch, like you probably have already looked at some of their work um, in terms of modular systems as well. I, and it, this one isn't, you aren't talking about this as much, but you know, the floating dairy farm. Mm -hmm. You're probably familiar with the floating dairy farm. Mm -hmm. in, yeah, that one is much bigger, but you know, there might be another yeah, project, but, but it's more of a sectional kind of division of what happens above and below. And yeah, but but it, they're also interesting because they're trying to figure out how to make a full cycle system. You know, really taking even things on the garbage from restaurants on land, giving it to the you know the whole thing. What do you do with their methane? What do you do with uh, their poop? Mm -hmm. And I, I like that about your project. I think there that whole like how can one component start to do many things becomes something that we've always been interested in. I think is intriguing. Yeah, it's nice as as the frame that either becomes a solid or a void. I think there's a lot. But I think uh, there that. might be a loosening up a bit of the geometries so that you allow for different kinds of experimentation to happen. So once you get a grid, it can be really rigid. It's like oh my god, you're kind of Hexagons can also be great, but they're also can be like you get locked in. So yep. somehow building in some flexibility so that someone like us could come in and we could bring in a, a geometry that might not be fit right into a rectangle, possibly. Yep. Or I mean, one thing might just be thinking about, you know, how can you, and the life arc rendering showed that, is like, how could you have these canals where boats could dock. So, you know, a boat is fundamentally like a different thing that comes in. And so true. you have to create slots. Or yeah, that's voids. true. So that's I think, true. Yeah. Okay. I think that could loosen it up, you know, and maybe, maybe it just spreads out like that a little bit. So I think there's, there's ways to play with it once you have the base. Yeah. Kind of that, that's really very, very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I like it. There was something about when you had the the holes. It almost thought of like is that the joint. So I think thinking about how the how the joints happen is also something. Yep. So th actually, those holes are along the. It's actually for for them to scale up the platform, and uh, the joint is also for them to actually connect to the anchor. So yeah. the yeah the mechanical platform consists of those kind of uh, mount that can be scalable. Right. So we found in our work, uh, just developing things over time, is a joint is like key, like a joint in water, because it has it's not like on land because there's so many ways things have to move. So sometimes our naval architect would say just use a rope, you know, because a rope can be multi flexible. Yeah, that's true. Actually, as soon as you start to, to like Maybe. create rigidity, you create a lot of force because when you think about the longer it is, the the more force there is. So maybe you introduce some flexibility as well. So maybe there are parts that can be fixed and parts that can start to be more flexible. But that's that's kind of okay, it's into the whole naval architecture. Thank you very much. Yeah, nice work. Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Silver. So, uh, so uh, basically, the background of this project is same as Naval. Uh, it's in Lantau Island in that song to try to maximize the use of that, that song. So, uh, my initial design is about algae farming, but not just only algae farming. It also includes the system of the uh, the algae collector which can uh this this is the algae collector system you can see there's a uh, uh the spin can be uh adjust in different levels of the sea so they they can not only the algae on the sea surface but also there's a because that that algae also consume the oxygen in the sea so that's why uh, i'm trying to collect the 
that algae as well. So the dead algae and the surface of the algae connect and then send to the uh, algae laboratory to try to dispute which is uh, that algae or, or which algae can be used for produce the farming because the algae can be used for industrial use energy energy saving. So so that's why there's a uh, uh, the algae collector connect to the laboratory and to connect to the algae farming. But at the same time, uh, the energy of the algae farming is needs the spin to to make the algae keep moving. So there's a solar panel system in the middle of the algae algae uh, farming. So basically the whole system is trying to maximize to use the that song. Yeah, mm. this is my initial concept. So is the algae for eating? As a, is it a, what, what are you thinking in terms of the cultivation of the? Uh, or is it? Can be, can be for eating actually, can be. But, um, but, uh, but I've, I believe this is mainly for industrial use. Okay. Well, you know, uh, what's interesting is like you have these algae laboratories, I think, and then and then these algae growing ponds are defined, uh, what would you call it in these? Uh, and, or, yeah, or tanks, yeah. So is it is it collecting algae, encouraging algae? Like, are you, because the wheels almost seem like you're, you're trying to remove it or you're trying to sort of sequester it, or are you trying to actually grow it? Uh, which is a much different way to cultivate where you're actually, uh, there's a place in Moss Landing in Monterey where they're, they're tumbling it. And the reason they tumble it is because it's better for, eat, for, uh, for restaurants. You know, you get this like tumbled, perfectly shaped algae. Uh, you know, you can also make biofuel out of it. Uh, when you, when I saw those algae, so see these bins. Oh, actually that's it right there, Monterey, Monterey, right there. You had it uh, go down. Well, it, all these blue bins are yeah. probably from. That's the one. That's right? where yeah. we do our biologists, right? Those blue bins. Oh, right? No, the one right there. That's it. Uh, the top one, Monterey Bay seaweeds. Yeah, that's exactly where we take our students. And <laughs> it it's oh, a very top, interesting yeah. research and. Um, uh, it's halfway between research. economics. So like a uh, business it's and a, uh, right, it's it's research. one arm of their research lab that is uh, partnering with uh, businesses. So mm -hmm. all that yep. algae is for food, yeah. And they are very close. They were, are able to take a pipe, <clears throat> but they take a pipe that's about sixty-five feet into this deep channel right next to the um the ocean on the, the ocean this is right on the coast yep. and they pump it in here and it's always moving like you're you're showing yeah the tumbling is actually helps it grow faster and also uh creates this round shape that is actually much better for like high-end eating so but what i thought about when you i saw those labs above is it's not that different than here and you'd be right over water so you would not have yep. to go very far to pump up and cultivate these this yeah. is what they're doing and it's like for yeah. very high end and you're in hong kong where you have this amazing food and yeah, so yeah. there's this whole dimension of economy that can happen with research so that's already happening here and that might be a good uh precedent yeah and people would be interested because they're cultivating um algae but also so you wouldn't limit it i wouldn't limit it i would try to broaden what you're, I mean, I, I get why you limit it because you can understand it, but here they're just taking that water. They're also for us, uh, abalone is a really a big delicacy. So uh, businesses are asking them to cultivate abalone um, mm -hmm. that then is, um, it's a, essentially a farmed abalone. So there's a lot of different things. So one of the things I was gonna say, cause I don't know says if you're asking them to do, um, but makers, maker spaces where there is a, a filament for 3D printing that is made out of algae. Oh, that's right. And so you could even think about cultivating algae to make filament to that make you materials. could actually make yeah. materials for whatever yeah. your project is. Yeah, I think there's a lot in algae, uh, you know, to yeah. uh, think about, you know, from biofuels to materials that, you know, even if you did keep it within the realm of algae, you could 
he'd really want to look at everything. From, because I think you'd want to start making direct. your own thing that you're cultivating. You start to make materials for your research center with the algae somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, okay. the colors are very beautiful, I think, because they're more muted. They're more natural colors. <laughs> Maybe not that one. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. Nice. But it's definitely an untapped resource. You know, I would say that you want to push that area. Yeah, so hello, I'm Calvin, uh, and my focus group is the NGO and uh, eco activism. So uh, the the design, yeah, <laughs> I, I just skip skip it. So the the design is about um, uh, you by using some uh, uh, small scale static devices to collect uh, the ocean debris, so as to provide a uh, opportunity for uh, data collection. Uh, for any further actions, like for regulations or for uh, governmental uh, uh, in interference for, for the uh, ocean debris problem. So it's, a, it's a like a, a three layers of uh, static uh, device, which uh, using the uh, waves and also the tidal power, the, tide, the, tide, the tidals to uh, collect the ocean debris in different scales. We are using different meshes so that uh, the data uh, of the about the ocean debris can be uh, categorized and also be uh, analyzed by the NGOs. So uh, this is basically the, the design and uh, the vision for this uh, experimental design is that it could be like uh, testing out the uh, mechanics and also the motions of the of the wave and also and so to um, maximize the um, efficiency in like collecting ocean debris and it could be like further expanded into more layers and also in larger scales in terms of uh, architectural uh, in, in architectural scale yeah so that's a section that's top view is that a section uh the first image oh, is, is, is the top view yeah oh, okay. the last the last okay. one is the section right yeah, it's 3d in the, in the middle okay I mean, the one thing to, to keep in mind or is, uh, is fouling, and we can show some slides of that, but you know, whenever you put anything in the water, it gets immediately, it becomes a surface to, to colonize. So just thinking about how it works with those. You actually animals. want to work with them. Yeah. Because you're not going to get rid of them. Yeah. Which is why, because uh, we, at here at the Autodesk Technology Center, uh, there are some people that are doing wind generation, um, ocean wind generation, and fouling is a big thing because when things foul, it gears anything that moves like that, it just yeah. becomes a mess. I don't know what your community is in Hong Kong. What your yeah, they do talk about fouling communities. So but what you're, you have an invertebrate community in Hong Kong. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm yeah. sure it's like us that there are a lot of invasives too, since it's a port. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Ho Zhe, and uh, my design is focused on open ocean aquaculture. And one concept is how we can survive the floating farm in the uh, typhoon on the open ocean. So you can see the top have a like a wind speed sensor. So the typhoon is coming and the solar panel can close. So the whole shape of uh, the floating farm can become a tumbler shape. So this can raise the uh, survive chance in the typhoon. And uh, another concept is about uh, how we can harvest uh, the, the farming. Uh, so the, at the bottom, there have an inflatable panel. Uh, when we 
um, pumping air to the bottle and the, the air panel will carry the, all the fish and the seaweed or something goes up to the sea level so the people can easily catch the, sea, the fish or anything they want just like a, a, on the ground. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you, can I see that? Can you go back up? Yeah, right, right there. there. No, the diagram? The diagram. Or the, the, with the pumping, the different, uh, not that one, the next one. The working one. condition. Yeah. Last uh, one, last one. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Type in. So it's sealed, or this, it can also come up okay. for the harvest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really nice not diagram. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, one of the things we found too, I think for all of you, is uh, what's really helpful because the ocean is so dynamic to show your uh, object or whatever your project is in various different conditions. It's very hard to do, but the quick diagrams like this is really, really helpful. Yeah, we had our students think about that sort of rough condition uh, just this year, you like do a really do a rendering like in a rough, rough sea for uh, the projects in the Maldives, just because that was something that the Maldivians were like, well, what happens in a storm? So it's something you really have to think about because you're very exposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they don't even have typhoons there, but I'm sure you guys do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. James didn't put it there. All right, so thanks so much for giving the feedback on, on the flight. That was, that was quite amazing like, to, that all the students get a chance to get your, your feedback. Um, yeah, really so, nice projects. Thanks really a lot. Nice um, so the so idea uh, uh, now is that uh, I'm gonna uh, ask, uh, listen to your presentation very carefully. You're, uh, you're, um, you're echoing a bit? Yeah, I think it's maybe some, some of the students were not on mute. Maybe now they are muted. Yeah. Okay, now it's better. Is it better? Yes, yes. Okay. So I actually, we can show the projects, but maybe from your students, um, if they've seen, if they've had a chance to see some of the stuff we've done, uh -huh. uh, what kind of things would they like to know? Because we can tailor it to actually be more useful for you rather than, you know, so I don't know if your student, if any of you have any, um, I think there's ways to raise your hand, or we're just learning this now from from doing these kind of meetings. But well, you can tell us right to now. To wave or ask a question, you know. So you can also the students can write their the the topic that they yeah. are most interested in the chat, perhaps. Yeah, so in the chat. In the chat for everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah maybe let's can. take uh, two three minutes to to write the question, and uh, we'll try to organize it maybe by by areas. So or like this, the uh, Margaret and Evan can can yeah. see. Uh, so please write down your questions in the chat. Uh, here, if you have some questions that come to your mind before they, they start to present. But for you, what, um, as instructor, what would be most right. helpful, do you think? Um, um, so that we could give them some practical information. You're not doing housing. That's the project that we're showing, but yeah. so much of our projects are not just about housing, but how systems support housing. But, you know, what, what would you, what do you think would be most uh, beneficial for your course right now? In my, in my opinion, what's, uh, be, because you have an advantage, you have done this for several years, and then you have worked with rural communities, especially I think the project we've done in the Maldives and the relationship you have with the local, local people, mm -hmm. and how you have a discussion with them to try to do something to address a real problem. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's really amazing to see how far you've mm -hmm. come uh, into not only conceptualizing, uh, so I think that's one aspect. The other one is um, the aspect of building something for the port of Auckland. So you managed to actually put a structure in the water, mm -hmm. you know, like what kind of argument did you use to convince the authority um, and what value do you bring to the community with this kind of, uh, so these are the two things in my mind that, are, that for me are very clear, like, wow, that's amazing. And that's like, yeah, right. that's what we want to be able to achieve in the future. Do something okay. that you can actually put in the water and that's useful. So to... Can you hear me? Hello, Cesar? Yes. Oh, I think I haven't presented. Oh, yes, but because uh, your, your page was empty. 
um, but uh, when I click onto my page, uh, there's contents. Maybe I share my screen. Sure. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm James, uh, yeah. and um, my uh, research is a site-specific Hong Kong uh, project uh, due to the unique tidal and current patterns um, in Hong Kong. And um, I, in this project, I want to upgrade the, uh, the water current conditions. So Hong Kong has lots of promenade uh, because of its coastal environment. So I want to work on um, the waterfronts. And to create recreational space, uh, water-friendly um, environments, and also uh, to think about measures to promote resilience against um, natural disasters, like the typhoon issue Caesar had um, mentioned just now. So um, I use existing uh, landscape technologies uh, of grid work walls, and um, I reference um, uh, foreign examples uh, of water-friendly designs like these uh, coast so sector assist. Um, I push the uh, river walls towards the sea, which originally is, um, uh, as you can see in the image, is front of the, the sea wall. So to uh, give two um, layers of soil medium, uh, first one is for um, plantation, for mangrove plantation, and the second, I, I would um, uh, intend to have it as an extended recreational space uh, an upgrade for Hong Kong because um, now most of the coastal areas are fed by railings and it's not really water friendly. So um, yeah, these are the three D ambitions of uh, the, the improved system, and I've tried to do um, a site design on um, the Changpano Promenade in Hong Kong, and I, I start, started also to think about details like how to uh, contain the soil in the soil medium. Uh, because the, the rootwork walls, uh, as you can see in the image here, they are big boulders. So the boulders cannot really retain the soil because there are gaps in between. Mm -hmm. And currents come, um, the, the soil materials will be washed away. And I'm thinking about uh, materials like geotextile fixed on concrete slabs to, uh, because geotextile is only permeable to water but not other um, uh, larger particle materials. So uh, these are the details I'm trying to explore. To, to facilitate the design. Thank you. And so what is the geotextile? Is it kind of a mesh that contains the um, rocks? Is that what it does? Yeah, uh, does it's, it? a lay, it, it's a kind of a, a sheet uh, of geotextile, which uh, it has small, tiny holes, which is only permeable to water. And it's very commonly used in the landscape industry. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, right. and then so what would you be planting in the the soil? Are the, is this a marsh condition? And do you have? I thought you said mangroves. Is that a mangrove forest? Something is mangrove something that is uh, grows in Hong Kong? Yeah, yeah. It will be mainly mangroves because um, okay. only mangroves can survive that condition. And okay. the, also give some ecological benefits. Uh, create habitats for uh, some coastal uh, organisms, yeah. Mm -hmm. This project reminds me, not in the same condition, but we worked on a project, we'll show you a bit of it, but I, I, you, you're, you're in landscape design, I'm as, assuming. Yeah. Are you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you must know SCAPE. Yeah. Do you know the group SCAPE from New York City? This, so New York City. Uh, what's the, the name you mentioned just now? Scape, S-C-A-P-E, Scape. I think I've heard about this. You should definitely look them up. Uh, we worked with them for a year in San Francisco Bay. They were leading our team. Uh, yeah, they're worth looking up. Um, they do amazing work, just like your t what you're trying to do here. And they, this project right here is a very, this is That's one in project. San Francisco yeah. Bay. So, you know, they were able to get this tidal pull so this is a, an engage, a piece that I didn't think they would be able to get permitted, but they are, they got it okayed. So it will be a public tide pool, but it's a whole edge condition. So they, they 
you would just find a lot of information just looking at the way they're they want they've done an oyster texture uh, uh, a living seawall in New York City they um, anyway they yeah. will they they're a fantastic they're amazing and um, just even learning just le learning from them how they uh, they communicate ideas they keep it very very simple and you'll if you dive into some of these projects you'll you'll see this is the one right here the if you stop there, the, the one that's on the <laughs> upper left is the one that has to do with living breakwaters, yeah, living breakwaters. which is a, a kind of what you're talking about, right? I mean, they haven't, they don't do work in an area that would have mangroves, so that would be quite unique. Uh, they but would, the living breakwaters was in response to uh, Hurricane Sandy in uh, New York City, so it was directly related to infrastructure that's both ecological and protective. So. Um, and that that's that was one of the big um, projects that happened after Sandy was. And they're just a great group because they teach too. Their their principal teaches at Columbia, but really they are practitioners. So they take it at a very they you know they these are things that uh, not all of them have been built, but they're definitely someone to look at when you're talking about this. And I see your project and the port. Um, of Hong Kong project starting to merge. Those are two, uh, two interesting sort of, you could see those two things merging well. Mm -hmm. Their drawings are beautiful too. You just have to take a look at some of their drawings. And the diagrams, because they're very simple. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing to learn, because we worked with them for a year, Oh, your son. <laughs> Sweet. <Yeah. laughs> so, you know, they're very good at working with agencies, you know, learning how to listen respectfully and then seeing where there are openings um, is another thing that they're very good at and coming up with simple diagrams like these to be able to communicate to different stakeholders. Very, very important. And that since your work is really about reaching that level of communication and influence, uh, I think they're a very good group uh, to, to look at for precedence. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Great, so I'm asking the students if they can um, write some of their questions in the, um, uh, in the chats. Do you guys see the chats? I, I I don't see any questions. I see the chat though. Yeah. So just no worries. No worries if you don't have. Okay. Uh, but yeah. you know, I would just if you have questions because we we are more more interested in ways that we can help you uh, rather than we're not here to show you our work or anything like that. But if our work can be of help to you, so we will just go through it quickly and maybe point out things that might be useful in regards to some of the work we've already seen. So I think that would be the best way. So I, I'm gonna take the screen, if that's okay. So if you can move, yeah. So you guys can see this? Okay, great. So uh, I'm, this is, um, our group is called Boy and Ecologies. We're actually a, we are working within the architecture uh, division at California College of the Arts. So it's an art school with two accredited uh, architecture programs, both master and undergraduate degree. And we have been working with a topic called Boy and Ecology since 2014 and in the last three years in the Maldives, so closer to you. And this is just some of the images. Uh, this was a project from last fall. This is the island we are working on. And this is, actually this is where the underwater, um, the underwater restaurant was. Okay, there you go. And oh, then... I'm at the end. I'm sorry, I have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> have to... <laughs> actually, let me just stop and I'm gonna, start again hold on just hit this 
Sorry about that. Okay. And so the Architectural Ecologies Lab came out of uh, the Blaine Ecology Studio when we realized that we were doing work that was outside of this, the curriculum, but you know, out there as research and independent projects. So, so we're going to go quite quickly. Um, I'm not sure why I'm not. Sorry. Okay. So we're just going to cover, uh, we'll introduce you to our lab and some of our work in San Francisco Bay that could be relevant to you. Uh, the site we worked at for three years that's closer to you in the Maldives and our work from last uh, fall, which is not published yet, so it's not viewable. And then what we're planning to do next. Uh, the three of us are the directors of this lab. It's not a physical lab because for us the lab is our San Francisco Bay. So we speculate in studios, but then we prototype in the Bay. That's been uh, probably the thing that has taken our work into a different domain. And that's what I, is exciting about what you're doing too, because it's not just about ideas, it's about testing those ideas. So for us, it's been a research platform uh, between design, ecology, and material innovation. So using the fact that we have digital technologies and how to you know, capitalize on that, te um, that technology. For us, um, we were able to work with a biologist. Uh, we, we have a team of biologists that we work with called Benthic Lab. So they study things that are living at the bottom of oceans generally. Uh, so they're called invertebrates. And they were the first people that said, if you have to, so I don't wanna go into, in San Francisco Bay, it's very regulated. You cannot float anything in the bay be without, if you're impacting marine life, it's not allowed. So we had to think about if we float, how could it be a benefit to the marine life? And so our biologists said, well, fouling happens, whatever you stick into the ocean. So all of you should know this, whatever you put in the ocean, things are gonna grow. And the things that are gonna grow are things like invertebrates, things that are, don't look sometimes like they're animals, but they're alive, they're animals. Um, because, and so their theory was if you contour or create a better habitat on the underside, so you think of the underside of anything that floats, surfaces as a facade for marine animals. So I think I, that's something I would offer to you all, is think yeah. of it as a facade for animals. And if you could create better surfaces for them so that they have different habitats, you create an ecology and small fish will come and bigger fish will come. And so that was sort of the beginning of- So the idea of a boat has to go fast, it has to be smooth, but if we're designing things that don't have to move, they can be contoured. And contouring is, nature is contoured, right? Everything in nature is contoured and animals find different habitats based on these spaces. These, you know, whether they're big enough to avoid predators or small enough to nestle in or even to filter feed if they're like on a pinnacle. So there's, uh, yeah, so that the whole communities have evolved around finding optimal surfaces. And so how can you begin to test these? Well, contours? and that's what you're going to be introducing. You're, if you think from an animal's point of view, yeah. you are introducing habitat or yeah. not. You're, that's either beneficial or not. And so we work in collaboration just like you do. I mean, I would say, what you're learning how to do in order to solve big problems like you're being asked to do, the only way that can happen is by working with people like that you were able to talk to last year or with us so we can share ideas. That's the only way. So it's nothing that is, um, you know, our design. We feel like we share because by sharing, you share with us and we have a chance to actually make a, a contribution. So this is some of the work that you could see on our website, but really it's speculative work that happens in studios, just like you are doing. And we work in teams of two, generally. Um, you, all these projects are done in a semester and it's with a team of two. At the same time, we're, um, as we, most of our students work in Rhino and use Grasshopper and 
So surface variation is perfect for those tools and we would take some of those ideas and then uh, take those models and then make them. And then we would put them in the water and test them and see how animals would grow on them. And this was one of our first plates where this is contoured, this is flat. So these are experiments that our scientists would put out and you could see the difference. They were side by side, but this one had much more cover and much more variation. So we were pretty excited about that. Um, this is just some other work. Uh, so the, the, the last, this is scape. This was scape's work. This is our work with scape. So instead of riprap, this isn't, in a, this isn't in a coastal condition, but might give you some ideas. This was riprap. We designed these to be seeding as well as cover for fish here and also holes that you could use the root system. So this is something you might think of too, because you could think of root systems of mangroves as starters so that once it grows, or some kind of marsh plants, that the actual roots itself starts to be um, the anchor for the soil. This is some work that we are doing in San Francisco Bay. It's in a restored marsh uh, where looking to cultivate restore oysters with different surfaces so we've been floating um, these plates and about a month ago after the plates were in the water for about a little less than a year we found that one plate which is only two by two had about 85 oysters so and this is a very compromised ecosystem so we're pretty excited about the potential of that and then this is as um, Cesar was talking about, this is the float lab and these two documents we always show because it was, it was really important. This is our US um, Army Corps of Engineers. It's, it's a federal national permit that we had to get and our, a local permit. And both of, these, both of these are very hard to get, but we persisted and it was really framing this. We had to frame it as not a vessel because it made people nervous. We framed it as a buoy, a large buoy, just a different, a strange looking buoy. And that seemed to change the perspective. And in the end, we were permitted as a fish enhancement device. So we were pretty happy. And it's been, um, it's in the port of Oakland. So it's right here. We're located right there. And we are putting prototypes on the bottom, hanging them. We're located right here. So the cranes are here and here, and this is the public part. So I'm very interested in what you develop in the port because that could be a very interesting conversation. And actually, if you, we might be able to, even as you get further along, have a conversation with our port here, with your port, you know, there might be a conversation that happens that way, that could be very interesting. And then our last three years has been work in the Maldives. We went to the Maldives because we were, part of the critique our students were getting was that they weren't, they weren't taking sea level rise, they weren't feeling the urgency of sea level rise in their projects. It felt too theoretical. So they said, you should go to a place like the Maldives where they're feeling the impacts now. And so that's what we did. We, with the help of people we met that do coral restoration, they put us in contact with Maldivians. So here is the Maldives right here. This is India. There are a hundred and, there are a lot of atolls. 1,500 atolls, uh, 200, uh, 400 are big enough to inhabit and 200 of those are resorts. So there's Kind of an interesting contrast between resorts and uh, like local islands. And so for us, this was the island that we've been working on for three years, and we were sighted there by Maldivians because this is an island that had served a um, population of about 800, and there's a shallow lagoon and a deeper lagoon. So it's already this is the deep ocean side. This is the inner um, atoll. So in their monsoon seasons, there's already the actual shape of the geometry of this uh, island is already protected somewhat. This is Mali, if you don't know of the Maldives, Ma this is the capital, it's very, very dense. And when I saw that one, uh, the restored, they, uh, where they, they built up the island 
in Hong Kong. That's what they did here in the Maldives. And this is the bridge that they built, the Chinese government built for the Maldivians. Uh, it goes from that to this. This is a little bit what you're talking about in Hong Kong, but for the Maldives, they don't have, Maldivians, they don't have, they don't have land. They're 1% uh, land, 99% ocean as territory. So they have to pump it up from the bottom of the ocean and become, and so this is all coral sand that they are building islands. And they just recently uh, dedicated four billion or more dollars to do this for many of the local islands. And so this is what the Maldives looks like. It goes from, uh, I think I'll just, resort. this is resort to local. So, so you see there's a dense inhabitation and then like sparse inhabitation. So again, this is the location we were working with. We, most of our projects are in the shallow lagoon protected from the deep lagoon. But still, there are high winds. Still, it is working on oceans. And so we don't have the capacity to model this digitally, to understand the wave forces. To, we, don't, we aren't able to design with that information. So we rely on consultants. But this is the inner lagoon. This is some of this. We went there this summer. Uh, these are, this is also looking into the inner lagoon. So even though it's protected, it definitely is ocean. This is some of the local um, uh, economies that they make thatched uh, from their palms. That it's they, mainly for resorts. So but, there's this interesting like low tech and then sort of high tech. Kind of so I would say these are some things to think about is as you're designing your uh, project to think about the local technologies like what's great about Hong Kong. Uh, and we actually will show you a project that actually came from a precedent from your university, mm -hmm. but you have bamboo and they don't have bamboo here, um, but you have Which bamboo. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is a boat that was built there. It took us out diving. He's one of the locals. This is what people come to the Maldives for because there's gorgeous diving. That guy was our biologist. This is our biologist. <laughs> so he dove all around we talked with locals so having conversations have bringing maps i would say bring maps when you talk to people visualization and drawing on those maps so we just had maps and they told us what is actually go these are divers and locals we just made notations on the maps that were better than anything that we could have got from there's so much of so much of being on the ocean is experiential and so much of experience is is not having people tell you what the actually conditions goes are how fast things change how rough it gets where the currents come from it's all it's almost like you know you think of an old sailor you know they have so much knowledge so right. that was what we got from these locals <laughs> amazing people but this is what's happening there erosion and i don't know if that's happening in Hong Kong, I imagine those are some of the issues too. And so this was our group of students. There were 17 uh, architectural students, um, both masters and undergrad. We, th we've taken this photo on a place called Sausalito, which is our, the only place that has legal, uh, it's a legal houseboat community. It's really a fantastic place. So there, these are all houseboats. So they went to visit. Uh, some of the things we realized early, like, like our second, um, we realized that we d just assumed we would take care of waste, but we recognized, we found out that actually in Southeast Asia, floating isn't that uncommon, but taking care of your waste is. And so in the Maldives, this comes from the main capital. They do not treat their waste. It goes straight into the ocean because they have a lot of it, so that's how they think of it. But we work with a group from Stanford University. It's one of our local universities. They have a place called Kodaga Research, Research uh, Resource and Recovery Center. You should look it up. Uh, what was intriguing to us was they talk about waste uh, being a resource, so that you can get clean water, nutrient-rich water, which is what can feed uh, marshes, mm -hmm. energy from methane, and a renewable material. And we can talk a little bit about renewable material. It's called mango material. I would 
look into it a little bit because what we're thinking about with ma mango mango material is they take methane and they feed it to a methanotrope bacteria. That methane makes that bacteria fat. That fat becomes plastic. And that plastic can make bottles. It can make uh, plastic. They're working yeah. with synthetic uh, fibers right now for clothing. It doesn't do well in seawater. But you could think, we're actually working with them right now about thinking about how you can make it thick enough that it will dissolve over time. That, and that's okay, because when it dissolves, it becomes actually food for fish. So uh, there is a way really to think about some things, materials dissolving. This is the, the technology center that both Cesar and, and Evan and I are part of, or were part of. These are our Moldavian students that we collaborated with last semester. This was us doing what we're doing right now, but yeah. with our students where they uh, worked, uh, you know, we're, we were 13 hours difference, um, very similar to here. And these are some of the drawings from our students. So for our students, it was uh, taking a wastewater, an anaerobic wastewater system, thinking about the waste on the island, treating that waste, extracting resources to start to build up new kinds of edge conditions. And so some of the projects that might be interesting to you, this was, the, our projects are always very coastal. They're not out in deep ocean. So it's a little different that way. But these, this project was about creating components. So what might be interesting to you is like using a pier to, this was an anaerobic system. So you go from black water that comes from the island and then it gets treated in different stages to then take the nutrient rich water that would then go into these different modules to feed different plants, marsh plants. So you could create sort of smaller closed knit communities as well as uh, something that's more adaptable. And as it gets bigger, it could be uh, aquaponic. Uh, and as you probably all know, when you pump these this water this water that isn't clean enough to drink but it has nutrients in it the actual marsh plants will clean it further so that by the time it goes into the ocean it's e even cleaner but it's a little bit like fertilizer for these uh it is fertilizer and then taking their other modules that take um so this is more of a detail about their pipes running taking that black water that's been processed to get nutrient rich water and it starts to um, feed, taro, feed the taro, feed taro yeah. that we learned in um, the Maldives would do well. And then we worked with a Australia, this team worked with an Australian coral biologist to come up with a kind of tiling that could become a good habitat for corals to attach to underwater. So this was one. Took an underwater school. This yeah. is another project that talked to, thought about uh, uh, coral blocks. So a, a kind of blocks, building blocks that could happen uh, when you have when you float when you're close to the coast and you float. You have the potential to also um, take care of the habitats below. So they were thinking about their community creating an underwater coral city. So this is what was on top. And then this is what they're imagining you would have these, this is, seems very ephemeral, but um, ladders that go down to these building blocks that would become coral restoration blocks. This group looked at, so this will be a little different for you because you're not looking particularly at culture, how, yeah. housing, but uh, this was about really thinking it's Muslim culture in uh, the Maldives and thinking about the call to prayer and how that creates a, a different way of people organizing themselves through a different time throughout the day. So the pace of the day, and I would say anything, anyone that's doing work on the coast, so the port, all the, you know, any of those, even I would say that's probably not true. Thinking about what that is even on floating out in the middle of the ocean too, what these, you know, the patterns and the, the pulse of the work would be very important to, um, we had our students create diagrams for them and then create this architecture. But this particular work was not only about 
creating culture up above, but also becoming wave breakers below. So it was a, a, a real living shoreline that floats. But thinking about the methane that would happen from treating the wastewater to uh, provide for some of the things that their culture, the community There's spaces fish where they- that they cook for days that, you know, actually it became like this hearth for the social gathering and uh, yeah, so. So understanding the culture is was very key, and we only could do this because we worked with a cult, you know, with the Maldivian students as well as locals. So this was also a design that was about creating habit. It was really a a, a breaker for the monsoon when the the winds would come in this way, that all these things would start to break waves so that it creates a calmer water before it hits the ocean, because this is the edge that is uh, eroding. Uh, really, this group really was interested in storytelling because that's how most of the history in the Maldives has been um, trans, uh, has been passed down from generation to generation. And so this is the project that looked at uh, University of Hong Kong because they were really started making things out of natural materials. And so there was a project that happened, um, I think, within your department where they took bamboo and used digital fat, you know, div digital technology, created a pavilion. Do you know that project? I don't know. Anyway, so it was really taking old, uh, very low tech, but um, an old technique because, uh, you know, scaffolding is that uh, there are still people that know how to make that and beginning to think of making boats, uh, but this in this sense, a bigger boat and how the making of a basket could create a monocoque kind of very uh, stable structure. So we worked with the structural engineer uh, to create these kinds of basket like structures that could have, that you could actually put fiberglass on the bottom. It almost became the mold. It became yeah. the mold for the, uh, the vessel. So that was their idea. How can you create systems for locals that could be done by locals, but using sort of new technology to understand them? And this was a group that discovered, worked very closely with the Maldivians, realizing that moving to the ocean on any is very, it's not for everyone. It makes a lot of people nervous, but it was very exciting to young people. So they learned that people that were older would not want to be on the ocean but the young people would and that liberated them because they realized that you know people that are younger would want to be climbing on the tops and so they they started to think about these as fields so that you could have a whole new landscape where you could cultivate uh uh using uh, like a hydroponic system so you would pump up water on the um the roof and that you would cultivate below. So you'd have two kinds of systems for soil up on top and aquaculture below. And then finally, this is a project that uh, really took the component of wastewater. So they started with wastewater, sort of an infrastructure system in the city, taking the wastewater, come up, coming up with modules that were small micro wastewater treatment centers. Those are on land, so on the islands. But they were amphibious, so if it flooded, they could float. Uh, that Then that water was pumped to this, uh, to mangroves that would grow mangroves. Mangroves take a while to grow, and then they would be transplanted. And this was the project that, uh, what's interesting about this is these are all components. So one, two, three, bamboo, so that things could be brought to the island in a container. The molds could be brought to the island in container and then be fabricated. It was simple enough that people that know how to build boats would know how to build this. So that's um, how they thought and about it. And they were that. locked together by these kind of rigid connections. So this is a visualization of being in that, looking at how they would create these nurseries with solar panels, all these nurseries were fed by the black water that was treated. So the nutrient rich water would start the mangroves and then slowly go into the water to the, a mangrove forest that could be a place where you could um, farm uh, shrimp and other, that's what these, these uh, fish nets were. 
So for us, the next, uh, our next step is to try to pilot some of these, get funding to pilot them. So we're looking some of the areas that are, are probably, these are things that you should think of as ideas too, because we know that they resonate uh, worldwide, is drinking water collection. So for the Maldivians, they are very dependent on water being desalinated or brought in by plastic bottles, which many of you are dealing with plastics, that's a problem. So we learned, this group learned early on that there's more than enough water. I don't know if that's true in Hong Kong, if you have enough water too, but you could collect it in the hull. In the ocean, there's lots of room, you need the weight for, so there would be seawater when you collect the water, these bags would push out the, the fresh water would push out the seawater. So that was sort of the idea. Uh, this is solar, uh, re, you know, renewable energy generation. There isn't much of it in the Maldives that's done. And, you know, one of the things about being open water is that there's nothing restricting sunlight. Yeah. From, you know, you can tap in on it all, just, you know, how to incorporate batteries and how you collect that as a resource. So this is, this, you could see this was all about um, how to do that on the top. So part of it was, oops, this was just hot water because these are for habitation. So hot water heating as well as PVs. And then this isn't, your projects are much more developed than this, but thinking about food security. So aquaculture, and now, you know, with the pandemic, we realize even more how important this is, is food security. So I would really push all your projects to be thinking about how we create food locally, how mm -hmm. we can think about emergency situations, um, yeah. And so, and then this was, uh, we're, we're looking to do some micro wastewater treatment centers, uh, treatment modules that are really like the size of a septic tank. So that, but can start to group together um, to create a community, very much like what you guys are talking about. And for the Maldivians, they're very interested in floating modules as a tourism kind of cooperative for locals. So I don't, Think that would be the same for you in Hong Kong but you know understanding what the desires are of uh, uh, you you're a big you're like the Bay Area you're like San Francisco it's a very big um, population. But there's something to being out on the water that you know has a kind of draw for people you know so I think capitalizing on that especially in a busy city you know you get out to the water you there's a kind of connection um, so that's, you know, something that people fly to the Maldives to get, you know, but. And I would just say again, one of the things that is our contribution as architects and landscape arch architects is not knowing all the engineering. It's, that's not, you're not, I mean, some of you are more, probably more inclined to structure engineering, building technologies, but it's knowing how to listen and take and synthesize all that and visualizing it back to these experts. So these kinds of renderings, it doesn't have, or even diagrams, they're super helpful for practitioners that are engineers to understand what the possibility is. So that's been our contribution, is really not just making pretty renderings, but that it's making that, all this stuff here was done in consultation with a structural engineer, how all this bamboo would actually be formed, could become, you know, what's primary, what's secondary, how to actually tie them. So if you go deeper, the systems are there. And we also thought about, and I think a lot of you are thinking about how do you actually fabricate and deploy them. So for this group, it was about sand, cr creating a cast in the sand and the beaches. This one was just taking components and then creating this sort of umbrella-like structure on site. Mm -hmm. This one was taking, everything was made. So it's this project, th this project right here, that project, when you looked at the fabrication, sorry, was all, was all done here. These were the components. Well, there's some different ones here with the hull, but most of the components were here that you could make short or long. So thinking about how, you would fabricate it is and that's where you would want to work with fabricators because they'll give you feedback that's what we do we work with fabricators and very early on they're very instrumental in helping us know what's really possible what's economical to 
actually not having to think of containers, but putting it in boxes that could be um, like crates, flown, yeah. crates that could be flown. So this team figured out what's the biggest size crate, how many, so three crates could make one unit. They and were, they came up with this kind of catenary curve, uh, kind of fabric kind of stand which you could lay the fiberglass into. So it was just a way of fabricating that was really incredible. So they could, they could actually create many different shapes, uh, like 10 different shapes out of just these different frames and these kind of catenary uh, pieces that hang, so. And I think that's it. And, and so these are just like you have, I know your list, well, by, by the end of your semester, you'll have a longer list probably than we do. But these are people that we work hand in hand every semester. We, uh, the Maldivians, that was new, but all the other uh, people have worked with us every year and year out to help us develop. Uh, we rely on their expertise to be able to tell us how to float, what we have to worry about. And actually, says so one of the things I was thinking about is our naval architect, we've developed with him. Uh, we have an exercise for buoyancy that we could give you, and your students could maybe use that to uh, mm -hmm. calculate some of their things that are floating so they can better understand. It's pretty simple. Uh, it's pretty simple. I mean, but you can we can share that with you so your students can use that. Um, yes, there you go. Yeah. And yeah, so actually all of these, uh, most of these people on our team are available to you indirectly through us. So if there are any people here that could help your team, um, you could just filter it through us and I'm sure we can get some feedback <laughs> for you. That's, that's amazing. I'll take a picture and um, and, uh, and I'll look deeper into that list. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for for sharing. That's uh, that's really amazing to see <laughs> all you all you you've done. And I know this is just a small part of what you've done as well. So um, super super impressive. Uh, I think finally we have some questions come in. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll ask my question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out. Um, also, we don't want to take too much of your time. You've already given us almost two hours, so I, I want to make sure that we don't abuse your your generosity yeah we're are you 10 a.m we are 10 p.m exactly <laughs> uh here it's uh one almost 1 p.m okay. okay yeah so we are we're okay but for you it's getting late um I, I have a question is um so you have you have all these ideas from the students that that came and you you, you built in different you, you built in different sites we got different uh, designs and proposition how did you decide which design you would actually build and get approved by the uh, Corps of Engineers and the Port of Auckland? How did you, did you combine ideas or did you, did you choose one idea or did you just choose whichever one could be accepted and how, how, how was the process? <laughs> to, to For the float lab, so because you are going, you are all working towards one design, so you a team of, uh, of a studio. Right. Um, we we didn't do it within it. We don't do it the way you're doing it. But you're going to do it next semester. Well, the I guess, right? we we had funding, so we knew we had a certain amount of material, right. and then we we really had wanted to have it something you could crawl into. Like even if it was like a, uh, you know, like you think of the first uh, astronaut. You know, they had this little capsule, but they could <laughs> crawl into it. So we we were really kind of clinging to that for a while, and then at the end, we're like, we just said, okay, let's. We, we had to give that up, you know, and then we, we came up with the idea the economy was to have the same mold top and bottom. Okay. And, you know, so but that, you know what would be interesting, we have a, I, we didn't share that with you, I, I, I guess I, I should have, but we have this drawing that shows the float lab, uh, the section of the float lab, and every st student project that sort of influenced different parts of it. So yeah. we feel like that was a culmination of different people's investigations mm. uh, so it's it may not look exactly like everybody's project but you yeah. are looking at things in a particular way that informs what the thing ends up being and I think it's just a different way of collaborating because yeah. you have to be okay with it not being what you think it should look like because the intention you know you know what the intention is and you're all after that uh, whatever that purpose is. And so uh, 
we also hired for so for us it was different we, it wasn't within a studio setting that we did the built work oh so we but we have done right. um there have been classes that do that and i'm not sure exactly how it goes from many projects to um the first substrates came as a detail of the overall shape so they were just like the biologist was like let's just make we'll make that and the fabricator made it and they tested it and that became like kind of a feedback but then i think recently it's more about taking extracting and distilling different designs into a single design or into a single uh, piece of research. so what do you how much time do you have to left in your semester uh or, we have uh, so the the final presentation uh, the final is going to be may, may, right? may 22nd yeah so uh, and we have by that time, time you only have one design or many designs well, there is a different. Uh, so, because of the virus, uh, it's uh, it's not very clear of when we're going to be able to come face to face. But because I run also a big maker space, we actually have the ability to build a really large structure. So, my thinking mm -hmm. is that for the next months, that we get the students to collaborate on one design. Hopefully, then a month later, uh, then uh, they, they can come back and physically build the thing together. Mm -hmm. uh, if they cannot. Then, uh, then we will build it in, in, the, in the studio. But one of the things as well that we have to choose very quickly, I think in the next session is gonna be the site. Where do we build it? Because that's gonna inform a lot of the, the designs and mm -hmm. where can we get permission to put in the water as well? So there's a, yeah. yeah. So we have essentially one month to finalize the location and, and the design and then one month to build. Um, but I'm trying to get the student to uh, really focus on the mission. And like what you said is to have them collaborate. Um, because a lot of the times it's not about like, oh, this is my design, but it's more like how, how do you get past the ego and trying to achieve something as a group? Of course, not everybody's design and aesthetic is going to be there, but the idea is like, okay, well, that's working in team. There's lots of um, uh, compromise that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could, um, because there are some projects that are easy that are on the ocean, like they're more floating out in the ocean, and yeah. then there are devices that might leave that, and there are a coastal exactly. project, right? Yeah. I would maybe consider doing both. Like, yes. you know, having a coastal edge and mm -hmm. then having one that may be farther out. Mm -hmm. And then these devices that might go from in one to another, like go in, I don't know. So there are a lot of cleaning. Totally so then it's not one, but maybe two strategies that you right. then can build. Comp yeah. So what was helpful for us with, the, uh, with our work is taking just one portion. I mean, you, you're moving faster than we are and you have, you're scaling much faster than we do, but even just taking components that are buildable, keeping things, some things speculative, but really developed, because mm. you're not mm -hmm. gonna be able to do the coastline projects as fast as, well, I don't know, maybe in Hong Kong you can, but like that might take longer where if you're giving a port strategy or a coastline. I mean, in terms strategy. of permission, you can think of uh, like our biologist, the first one of the first things he did was in a marina. So he knew the marina owner and, you know, you can just put something right in off the dock. And then, okay. you know, he did his first experiments there and that led to kind of influencing with what we put on the float lab. Uh, other, other projects like the one in the Presidio, we didn't have to get permits for because it, it was all part of a restoration permit. So they were like, okay, this is good. You just kind of, well, we'll fold this in. So I think there's ways to think about it, or maybe one's a mooring. You find a mooring and you can like attach onto that, or, you know, I, th I think there's, it, it's, it's hard because you have to sort of roll with what, what, the, what the world gives you, you know, like right. I, I think trying to find that little opening, you know, and then just being very persistent and seeing if you can, uh, I'm so one of the questions was some of the materials for the float lab to uh, to draw, attract a species. They're going to attach whether we like it or not, but we contoured the underside. And for our bilateral, and this is something for you all to think about because you're thinking about always research science. And for our biologists, and I'm sure it'll be true when you talk to yours, is variation. They like extremes from one to another. So peaks and shorter peaks was really based on an experiment. They didn't want to see two of the same. They'd rather see one deeper and one more shallow because then they could see if it made a difference in how things were colonized. And dropping things from, so so many of yours is already, do, you're already doing 
dropping of structures that are yeah, more aquacultures. Yeah, things are, Thinking yeah. of those things as columns for habitat. So you just start to design them. So pockets, think of coral reefs, you know, thinking of little nooks and crannies for fish to go in. So we're creating a lot of fish habitats. I didn't, maybe at another time we can share some of the, we have some prototypes that are these columns that are 3D printed, made out of calcium carbonate that are printed and they're, we don't, I know we're looking, we might have it here. <laughs> but uh, so we're, we've been using fiberglass, but the fiberglass has a sand coating. So it has sand, there's a, and we're finding that that sand helps attract things like oysters and, and mussels. So, you know, the coating is, it's all an experiment. So I would just say setting up, not saying you know, but saying that these are way, it, it, you want to be able to create surfaces and place spaces for, so variations can happen. So you can experiment because we don't know. Yeah. So I see the, your, your projects in a way as more, more like the flow lab than anything else in that uh, you want to be able to, to hang different things or change things or manipulate things. So the, the ones that are the most flexible, I think uh, what's interesting would be to show a range of adaptabilities and permutations and possibilities because really you don't, you're not gonna know. You're just like with the flow lab, we don't really know until we start hanging things and we wanna be able to hang something different. So, um, you know, it's, it's really like a new frontier in a way that you guys are building in. So. I also think in terms of like the second question about cleanup and scale, I maybe that person could elaborate a bit more. But um, one of the things I think too, um, Cesar, is to really think about scale. So the flow labs won scale because we could afford that scale, right? And we knew it could float and it was sizable enough. But we're always thinking with the digital, you can scale up. So even if you only prototype something small to be able to show in, in renderings and images, how you could scale up. That's where it becomes very interesting, the play of built and then unbuilt. Or how it could tile or have an array, you know, with the different possibilities and, you know, site conditions that could, you know, it could lend itself to. So one of the things uh, that the people that are doing ocean debris cleanup, you know, maybe there is a time if that, because I think there, that's a topic that's coming up a lot in your, your studio. So that's obviously a direction one team or a group of teams are going to take. We might be able to share, maybe we can do another session where we could share with another team. We're meeting tomorrow, but we're, we've been working, we have a lot of research and stuff on plastics. And I would say your devices are, are really right in there. I think they're very good. Um, some of them are, I could see them being built. Uh, right now so and we were also scaling up with the the uh, c-bin thinking mm -hmm. about how a c-bin yeah. could be scaled so but we're not scaling as as high as big as you but we always think that if you could build it here how could you build it bigger so i don't think it's that different mm -hmm. um and uh you know another thing is is thinking about uh ecological remediation as a kind of a strategy to to mitigate something else that you're doing that might not be as you know helpful to the ocean let's say it's an industrial use but then there's a mitigation so you begin to sort of have a trade-off you know like be able to sort of justify one with the other you know so a functional let's say it's an algae farm or bio algae farm but then it's also doing something else positive in terms of habitat so it's not just extractive but it's sort of uh giving back in a sense. Or. So the different kinds of tiling and how those forms are designed, that is like a back and forth that we always have with our biologists. So our students will come up with tiles generally and then show the biologists and then they will, they will usually, have, you wanna have many variations. So not just one, you have, usually if you're doing it digitally, you can go peaks higher, lower, uh, there's a word called rigosity, which maybe you have already heard about, but we learned it from biologists. Rigosity just means a lot, a lot of surface areas. And uh, so that we found that our students 
just getting feedback. So a back and forth with showing different tiles, getting feedback, doing different iterations. That's how we came up and discovered new things like fish. They called them fish apartments. You know, we didn't think of fish apartments, but then they started seeing, they start seeing things that we don't see. So, it's so that's true with actually with a fabricator, even with a fabricator or with a biologist. I mean, they both have their way of understanding the world. So what's great about uh, what you guys can do in the studio is you can, you can visualize something that immediately like gets them like firing about some way to make it or some way to, you know, what kind of habitat you could make there. And I think that's where you really get a, a nice uh, back and forth that you can start to really like develop something quickly and then have it be really tailored to like a fabricator's understanding or a biologist's understanding. If you can synthesize those two things, you've actually done something, you've put two disciplines together that were, were sort of siloed, right? So it's, there's something- So really one tip, Synthesis. Talk to them, um, draw, sketch for them. When you hear what they say, sketch again, keep on asking questions. So you never lose, when you have 10 minutes with them, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You want a lot of iterations to go on in that really short time, and you're just going to be amazed where it goes. <laughs> so, my, our battery, I didn't plug it in. We got 3%. <laughs> That, that's but, what I, I think it's about time we're probably gonna have to cut off yeah <laughs> yeah wow that's um that's really, really amazing <laughs> thanks thank you so much for the the feedback and the, and the, the presentation that's uh, that was i mean for me it's uh it's the second time you introduce but um in the light of uh, the what the student presented it's, it's super super helpful um Good. Wow. Um, so the students are now like kind of halfway through the, through the projects. Um, they're going to keep improving. I think what you mentioned, like creating groups of interest, like maybe some of them more interested in like waste management, maybe some of them more yeah. in like observation and tourism aspect of it, yeah. um, like a land and uh, ocean connection, maybe building like two structures instead of one. Um, I wanted to show something really briefly. Um, when I was developing my, my designs, um, we build this uh, thing just at, at home. Just you can see it's hot glued and bamboo toothpick. Mm -hmm. And a week after, um, we just took a day of, of build and we just took this really cheap wood. And then we build that structure and try to, uh, try to see if it's mechanically strong enough to support several people. Um, what I'm trying to say is that we can build things really, really fast, really cheap, um, and, and try them on land or on the water. It's, 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 uh, it's possible. Uh, so yeah. it seems to feel like, oh, wow, this is really daunting. Uh, yeah, it can be done. It can be done really, really quickly. And actually, um, it was the first time it was crazy, but this last sem two semesters ago, two years ago, was the first time we actually brought uh, aquariums into our studio. And uh -huh. it seemed like a no brainer. But having students just make small little models that they could just stick in the water and see how it performs. Yes, yeah. See how it so everyone probably has. On it and see how it or put it in your bathtub, <laughs> whatever. If you're yeah. at home, because we are all we are in California, we yeah we are all teaching remotely. We can't go out in the same way anymore. But uh, there there's lots of ways to test things and photograph it and video it. <laughs> so that's how we yeah. Say. Thank you so much. I don't much. think we shared with you the app too. Remember, did we share with you the app? Oh yeah, the flow. Um, I mentioned it to them, uh, but um, but uh, um, I could I could definitely look it up again. Um, I, I gonna, will share it with them if you if you want to put it in the. Well, I'm going to just show topic. you. I'm going to just share the screen one more time. And uh, yeah, or am I? I don't know where I am. Before your battery dies. <laughs> yeah, actually, I don't think I'm going to get it. W tunnel three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, if you it's um, it's a really easy app that one of our building technology specialists shared with our studio. You can just draw and you can see it's for wind, but it works for water yeah. and just to help you understand the hydrodynamics. Yeah, it's all fluid dynamics, but you, you can learn a lot about how how you constrict flows and you know create. Uh, so anyway. Um, let us know if you <laughs> want anything else. Yeah, yeah. And um, we'd be happy to work with some of your teams more directly if that is uh, useful.
Yeah, this was fantastic. So I, th I think maybe um, so there will be so the, the final presentation will be on May 22nd. In between, th there will be one point where we'll have a, a combined design or we decide of a design before we start the construction. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe at that point, uh, I will send you the design that, that we are thinking to build before we actually start building it for the very last few feedback. So like this, before we start the construction, um, like this, we will get some of your, some of your inputs. Sure, whatever you think. Yeah, whatever sounds you need. great. Yeah. We are not going anywhere. That's the way it is. <laughs> Everybody's at home. <laughs> no, we are here. Yeah, and okay. anyway, when you call people now, it's funny because they pick up because they're home. <laughs> you know, it's thank you all, students. I, I thought the work was really great. Yeah. It's very fast. You did a lot. Um, yeah. And so thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, good luck. And any kinds of questions that come up, just, you know, filter them through. Caesar and we can hopefully answer them if we can. Thank you. You've been very, very generous of your yeah. of your time and knowledge. We really, really appreciate. It. And um, sure. yeah, we've been inspired by your work. And uh, yeah, we, we hope that we can cross uh, at some point uh, cross fertilize each other. As well, well get it in yeah, the water. Definitely. That's what makes it all real. So it, I'm excited. It's in there. Yeah, it's big. <laughs> yeah. The water it's doesn't lie. All yeah. right. Care. <laughs> bye bye. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. bye. Yeah. Bye. So if you can just hold on just for uh, one minute, uh, I'll be very, very brief because I know we already passed the time. Uh, thanks a lot for showing your work. I didn't expect that they wanted to see your work in such detail. I expected it was just going to be like one sentence, and but I think they were very excited to see your guys' work, so that, that's great. Um, uh, what I'd like to say is that, so it's almost perfect on the, on the wiki. I can see that most of you have posted. Um, a couple of you didn't post in the right place, so some of you posted in the group, so if you could break it down to individuals. I just want to make sure that, for example, I think it was Oswin and Jessica, oh no, Oswin and Ceci, for example, I think you're on the same page, or the Jessica and, well, there's, there's two of you, I think, are in groups that show in the same page, but if you could break it down. And uh, what I would like to make sure is for next week, is that you actually um, um, uh, think about what they said is that what is the strength about or the, the focus of your, uh, of your area. For example, when some of you work with a nonprofit and you talk about like plastic waste, um, I think that's the good direction is that we start to um, break down the group that we had as background research and then go, go into groups of, of interests. Um, so some of you, I think, are focused more on what's happening on the land. Some of you are more interested in what's happening with the waste, um, observation, more the touristic area. Some of the group might remain the same, but I think some of you are going to be kind of merging with other uh, interests. Um, what we are going to do next week is that we're going to be looking at, uh, we are going to be working on concept board. So we'll be working on a big tile, on a big uh, uh, image. And we're going to be trying to, we're going to be doing lots of sketching next week. So we're going to, that's why we'll be using concept board. But we'll try to see, okay, each of your groups, um, how can we produce something that's going to converge into one design? Uh, so there's going to be one aspect of the work. And the second, we're going to be looking at where can we actually put in the water? So we're going to be trying to uh, find, uh, find a, a location where we can put in the water. So I'm talking to um, a professor at HKU who has a fish farm. His family have been having a fish farm. I'm trying to convince him to put it there. Um, I'm talking to the Aberdeen Youth Club as well, uh, because uh, uh, last year they allowed me to uh, bring three experimental vessels in the Aberdeen Youth, Youth Club. So I'm trying to talk to them again to see if we would be allowed uh, to put something in the water again. Um, I remember, uh, I think it was uh, some, some of you said that you might have some connection. So that's going to be the other part is, okay, where, um, whatever we design, where can we actually put it? And uh, depending on that discussion, it is also going to define what can we build. Um, so these are, I think, the, the three different components is also going to be about the money. So I'm also trying to secure the funds. Um, so at least we would have an idea of the budget uh, that we finally have. Uh, so at least we could see, okay, how much money do we have? Where can we put it? And then how we combine our ideas into, into uh, one place. So um, what I'll ask you to do for next week is one is clean up the wiki, making sure that each of you individually have your, your designs and also share your original file. So if you have STL file or Rhino file, uh, please upload them on, uh, on the wiki 
So like this, everybody else will be able to um, to take from your, be inspired and start to, to recycle your design. Now it's about uh, forgetting about, you know, this is my design, this is about, okay, how do we turn our ideas into something real that we can put in the water? Um, in, in the end, I think, if you think from a portfolio perspective, there will be like one final piece, which is gonna be similar to, you know, to their float lab. And then there will be the sources, which is gonna be all of your individual designs. So it means that each of you in your portfolio, you will have your design, which is what you have done so far. Maybe you pushed even a bit further when you start to break it down to teams. And all of us will be able to say, at the end, the studio produced this work that we have put in the water and tested and made those observation. Yeah, so, so clean up the wiki and share your source file. Very, very important you share a source file so everybody can, can use your materials as well. Um, is that clear for, so how, how, how was it today? How did you like to today, the, the session? Yeah, I think it was great because it was even more kind of detailed feedback uh, compared to last week, I think. So I think it was great to have kind of a second, another opinion. And I think they have a very uh, like in-depth knowledge of all this like designs and ideas. And uh, I think a lot of ideas we can really benefit from. So what's great is that you benefit from the years of doing a similar studio to ours. And what's really, really cool is that it's possible that for next year, so it's not first year, but for the, for the one next year, is that they might actually move away from the Maldives, but the Maldivian are very, very eager to continue to find external collaborators. So maybe not for your class. For the class next year, it's possible to actually uh, go to the Maldives. So the design that you're going to do actually are going to inform uh, because um, uh, the way the university works on their cases, and in their cases that they get funding to work on one site, uh, but eventually after two or three years, the university is, is just like, okay, this is for research, we're not gonna build it. Um, and so they have to move away for the research. But then commercially, their agency is looking at taking some of the students who have produced the designs as interns uh, and actually build in the Maldives. So yeah, so, so it looks like we may be, um, getting uh, inheriting one of their one of one of their sites and some of their partnerships for for next year so um yes yeah, just so you know that this is uh this is long term so what you're going to be doing this year is going to inform as well what the students are going to be doing for for next year uh, somebody else has some has got some some feedback did you feel your questions were were being answered Uh, yeah, I was just about to ask another question, but um, seems time uh, is quite limited because I want to ask if they had experience working uh, on more exposed areas um, because some projects um, they they suggest like the skate studio work uh, is in quite enclosed or protected space. So um, the kind of uh, material, the the work that we built uh, is um, how resistant, uh, how re resilient it it is against um, the natural wave force. It's also a concern, I think, because for Hong Kong, most of the, the coastal areas are quite exposed and wave is quite strong. So whether our design can, can survive the wave is also what we can think about. Yeah, maybe see if you can ask them, it would be nice. That's a really good question. So I think what we can do, um, so similar to asking question, one of the ways I think we can uh, kind of narrow down the design eventually, and this is something we'll do in the next session, is gonna be uh, trying to set up goals. So one goal may be like, if you work on plastic, is how can we collect the maximum amount of plastic? Another goal could be, how can we show Hong Kong, Hong Kong people or tourists the beauty of our seas? Um, so I think like, sometimes if we transform uh, our intention into a question, it's helping to define a design. So for example, like what you just mentioned, like how can we make a design to be resilient to harsh weather or like more uh, rougher, rougher weather? That could be one of the constraints that we set for ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I guess I'll see you next week. Uh, I will send you a quick um, recap email. And I will also add the references uh, that they have shared today because they shared a lot of references. I'm, I'm going to put them in the wiki and start to organize them in the wiki as, um, yeah, just like food for thoughts and, and references because I think they, they share a lot of really, really cool um, examples. 
And then if you have a more example that you want to add as well in the wiki, you'd be most welcome to, uh, to add them up as well. Uh, I'll share as well the, the wiki uh, link so you can add in the list. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.